Well, good morning, Village family. Thank you for tuning in. As you know, the month of July, we're not doing live services, but what we've done is gone back and picked some of the best talks and presenting them to you again so you can see them. You'll pick up some things that'll be helpful for you. Even last week, which was one of my talks on play, Jane and I watched it together and we, we thought it was wonderful. We said, well, we gotta change the way we're doing things. And this week we have put some things into practice from that talk last week that I did a few years ago. Today's talk that we're gonna play was only preached about a month ago and it's Stan talking about gratitude. It is one of the greatest talks I have ever heard. You are going to love it. I hope you will just settle in with your coffee and just relax and watch and listen and learn. It's gonna be so, so good. Love you, I'd love to pray, and then we'll roll right into stand. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for people who are watching. May our hearts be enlarged this day. And may we understand better what true gratitude is all about. We love you, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. A few years ago, I um, was reading a, a book. Well, I say reading a book. It was not really a readable type book. It was more a book of quotes, but the book was um, compiled or redacted by a guy named M. Scott Peck. Uh, Peck was famous for the book, The Road Less Traveled. He was a brilliant psychiatrist. But in this particular book, um, Peck divides what we would call virtues up into six major categories. And then brilliantly subdivides those six categories into about 85 virtues sub-virtues, all of them you would be familiar with. But as I was perusing the book, it was just one of those easy books to pick up and put down, reading quotes from different people on the great virtues of life. I began asking myself the question, if, if I were to rank, if I were to prioritize what are the most important virtues to me? What are at the top of the list in terms of defining what a healthy psyche, what a healthy soul would look like? In particular, I, I had young children at the time. My kids are now 16 and 23, but the thoughts still persist. I was really able to practically ask myself the question through the lens of their lives and what I wanted for them, thinking about if I could shape and mold the adults that they're one day going to be, who would they be? How would their life be characterized? What would be the definition of their character? And the six virtues that I came to, and it's in the years that have followed, I still haven't subverted these six with any others. These are the top for me. They shouldn't be the top for you, but I think it's a good exercise. The six that I came to were honesty, curiosity, courage, humility, gratitude, and love. I, I would hope that my children would find a life. I would hope that I would find a life marked first by honesty, because if you're not honest, if you're not honest, then everything is skewed. If you're not facing life with sincerity and subjecting yourself to the truth, whatever it is, then you're living, I think it was uh, Carl Jung that said, even God doesn't know the imposter that you send out because the imposter doesn't exist and God doesn't deal with unrealities. Honesty first and foremost. And then one I think that's often overlooked, curiosity. I want my children, I want myself to be curious. I, 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 want to, I want to have an attitude of exploration embedded in my soul, at the substrate of my soul. To be willing to honestly, I mean, if you're curious without honesty, 
Uh, I, I think both are compromised, but if I can honestly, curiously explore, then the, the next virtue I think that would be needed for me would be courage, because if you're honest and you're curious, you're going to face some realities that affront your comfort, that unsettle you. And I think it was Aristotle who said, courage actually is the one virtue of all virtues that finds itself in every virtue. Because courage is every virtue at the moment of test. And that's one of the points of virtue, isn't it? Virtue is that thing you do, that right thing you do, even when it's hard. And so courage is involved in every virtue at the moment of that virtue's test. And if a virtue doesn't stand up under test, then it's not a virtue. I want to be honest. I want my children to be curious. I want them to be courageous. And then I want to be humble. Because if I'm honestly, curiously, courageously engaging life, I want to also recognize and this is at the base of humility for me, that I'm not the only one honestly, curiously, and courageously engaging life. There are others doing the same, and I should listen to them. My voice is not the only voice. My thoughts are not the only thoughts. There are people just as valuable and worth as much as I am that are also doing this. And if we could do this humbly together, if a group of people could honestly, curiously, courageously engage life with a measure of humility that brings us into community, then we have not only our experience, but the shared experiences of others. And then the fifth virtue is the one that I'll spend a little time talking about today, and that's the, the virtue of gratitude. And I, I approach life from the vantage point, and I've not found another way to approach life from the vantage point of its givenness. Life just seems to me to be gift. And the nature of the giver is something that we've all been exploring, religion has been exploring, philosophy has been exploring, we've been exploring as a human family for a long, long time. But for me, when I think about God, my first emotion toward God is not love. Love an affection for something that at times can seem, someone that at times can seem so distant and so abstract, it has not always been the easiest thing for me to find. But at the base of my sense of God, there's always been two things that persist. One of them is awe, just a sense of the largeness of God, the vastness of God awes me. And the second is gratitude. Uh, it was Frederick Buechner who said it so in such a lovely way. He said, I, I sense the givenness of life, and then this phrase, and that I who might not have been am. <laughs> I who might not have been am. At the base of life, I, I think, should be a sense of gratitude. I looked in the dictionary. Um, wasn't that helpful, but I looked up the, the, the noun gratitude, it wasn't immediately helpful, but the digging got better. The dictionary said the, the gratitude is the feeling, the feeling, the sense, and I like this word better, the quality of being grateful. The feeling, the sense, the quality of being grateful, thankful, or appreciative. In other words, gratitude is the recognition, the awareness, the consciousness that I have been helped, that I have received a benefit, perhaps even from myself, but especially from others. Gratitude is my awareness, my consciousness that I have received an advantage, a benefit, but more than the awareness, gratitude is the willingness to express the same. I've been told in times past that I, I'm not a, a grateful person, and I really had to dig down uh, in, at, at times when people meaningful to me have expressed that they didn't sense that I was thankful or appreciative of something they had done for me. And as I dug down into my heart, I always felt that wasn't true. I always felt deeply grateful to them. But 
when there's some measure of consistency and three or four times in your life someone has said something as significant to you, someone who is significant to you has said something as significant as you don't strike me as a grateful person or I don't feel your gratitude toward me and our relationship. Though inside I deeply felt grateful, I realized the problem was not in my recognition, my awareness, my consciousness of being helped or receiving a benefit from the relationship. It was that last little part of the definition and the willingness to express the same. I don't know exactly why it was hard for me. I don't know why that kind of intimacy, at least immediately I didn't have an awareness of why it was hard for me to express. I knew I felt it, but I, I realized there was, there was a reason they didn't feel I was grateful because no matter how much I felt it, if I didn't express it to them, how were they to know? So the question then for me became, what is it about that intimate moment of expressing and I realized all entwined and growing up in a very fear-based relationship with God and, and a lot of things about my childhood. As I dug down to the root of that, I realized that feeling grateful to another person involved the recognition that they had something that I didn't have that I needed. That they were giving me something that I needed, which meant they had it and I didn't have it. And from the economy that I came from, that made me feel bad about myself. It made me feel like I was less than them because life was always this competition to try to, to be better than you were and to compare yourself to others and to measure your worth by comparing yourself to others. There was always this sense growing up in that fear-based view of God that God was one day going to say, to some well done and what I heard was he was going to say to them best done better done and to me not done well at all and this sense of humbly recognizing that there are people who have something that I don't have I had to begin to tease out that that didn't make me less than simply because they possess something that I didn't have it simply was an invitation into community it was an invitation, it was a gift to have a deficit that could be filled by another person because it brought me into relationship with them and perhaps one day I would have something that they didn't have. It was Dorothy Day, the great social worker in New York who started the great uh, social work movement in New York back in the 40s and 50s. She said ultimately when we live in community, the idea of giving receiving really dissolves it's like east and west where is east and where is west because if you go far enough west you end up east and if you go far enough east i mean east and west the relative terms east of what west of what she said the same is true of giving and receiving when we truly live in community with one another the lines between who is the giver and who is the receiver begin to dissolve and we begin to really understand she said the words of Jesus, that it is more blessed to give than receive. And yet, in the giving and the receiving, she said, ultimately, I found myself with those I serve, being so served by them that the lines dissolve. And in the end, there is no definition of giving and receiving. There is only mutual sharing. That's community. When there aren't the rich and poor, when there aren't the smart and dumb, when there aren't the givers and the receivers, but there is a mutual sense of sharing. Not something that I've been naturally predisposed to, this idea of turning my hand over. I remember one day my grandmother looking at me as a young minister and telling me that I was very, very selfish and I couldn't imagine why she would call me selfish. And she said, because you're always giving. And she said, there is a selfishness in always being the giver because Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. Have you ever thought that those that you give to might love the honor, the decency, the dignity of being able to bless you, to give to you? Why are you always hoarding the best gift, the superior position in your mind? Gratitude, to recognize the advantage, the benefit that has come to me, 
And to recognize not only the advantage, the benefit that has come to me, but to recognize the source of that benefit and then be able to hold the gaze of the one who has given me that benefit and say, I needed you. And if it wouldn't have been for you, my life would be the less at this moment. And I want you to know that means something to me deeply. The reason I've been thinking about gratitude this week is I've, I've, over the last couple of years, been reading old books that I haven't read in 20 or 30 years. And earlier in the week, I pulled out a book by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl, uh, the book that he wrote that I hadn't read in years, is called Man's Search for Meaning. In, in the book, he mentions Helen Keller. We all know who Helen Keller was, but with profound plainness, born of her own plight, Helen Keller once said, Helen said, I have often thought it would be a blessing if each human being were stricken blind and deaf for a few days, especially if it would happen at some time during their early adult life. She said with ultimate plainness, I think it would make them more appreciative of sights and the joys of sound. Frankel, who wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning, was an Austrian neurologist and psychiatrist. He was most famously, beyond his work, he wrote prolifically about his life as a survivor of a Nazi concentration camp. In those camps, the Nazi concentration camps that he lived in, he lost his father, Gabriel. Frankel lost his wife, Tilly. He lost his mother, Elsa. He lost the, all of those to the, the gas chamber. And his brother, Walter, I don't believe, died in the gas chamber, but also died. So we lost mom, dad, brother, and wife. Frankel and his sister, Stella, as I remember, were the only members of his immediate family to survive. After the death camp, Frankel devoted his life, he said, to psychological health and specifically to healing, the healing of the soul, the healing of the psyche. Ultimately, Frankel, on the other side of that experience, believed people were primarily drawn by striving to find meaning in their life. That was his quote. People are primarily drawn by a striving to find meaning in their life. And if that meaning, Frankel said, if that meaning is found, it will enable people to overcome the most painful of experiences. Man's Search for Meaning was originally titled, and I think it's still titled thus in Europe, was saying yes to life. I like this title. I think I like it better than man's search for meaning. Saying yes to life in spite of everything. That's a great line. Saying yes to life in spite of everything. American editors, Ray, thought it was a little bit too long because it was saying yes to life in spite of everything. A psychologist experiences the concentration camp. In his book, he famously said, when we're no longer are able to change a situation, a gift comes to us. When we are no longer able to change a situation, a gift is given to us. And that is, we are finally challenged to change ourselves. When the incapacity to change everything around us, as my old sponsor back in al days used to say, Stan, there are only three things in the entire world you can't change. Everything else you can change. And I would say, what are those three things? And he would say, people, places, and things. Besides that, you can change everything, right? The point is, there's really nothing that you can substantively change, Frankel said, except you. And the gift of being forced by circumstances to come to that reality as quickly as possible, Frankel again described as a great gift. Frankel said, everything can be taken. This is one of the quotes that stood out to me this week. Everything can be taken from a person, 
but one thing. The last of the human freedoms, and that is to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Everything can be taken from a man. Everything can be taken from a woman. Everything can be taken but one thing. The last of the human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Frankel, in his book, often spoke about the fact that the prisoners in the camps dreamed at night. He said, we had little to do in our hunger and despair, but in spite of our hunger and despair, one of our finest and most frequent of enterprises was to share our dreams. And he said, every day I listened to the description of the dreams of those around me. And he said, after months had passed, especially for those of us who had been there for years, he said, it became clear to me that the dreams became simpler. He said, we dreamed at night about bread. We dreamed about cakes. And we dreamed about warm baths. We ceased dreaming about houses and cars and nice clothes. Our dreams were eventually sorted and sifted to the simplest and the loveliest of things, the things that we often take for granted. Frankel observed that he and his fellow prisoners began to appreciate beauty as never before. In one poignant piece, he said, if someone could have seen our faces on the journey from Auschwitz to a Bavarian camp, in the cattle cart, silently lining the crevices we could look through. He said, if someone could have only seen our faces as we beheld the mountains of Salzburg with their summits glowing in the sunset, as we looked through those little barred windows, those little slats, those spaces between the wooden planks, as we peered out of our prison carriage, he said, if someone could have seen our faces, they would have never believed that those were the faces of people who had given up all hope of life and liberty. Despite all of our losses, I remember that day, despite all of our losses, and maybe because of them, as our eyes fixed upon Salzburg summits, we were carried away by nature's beauty a beauty we knew we had missed for so long. It was King Lear who said, how sharper than a serpent's tooth is to have a thankless child. I'll never forget the day. It was a game changer for me. 16 years old, I came home from school, basketball season was beginning. The shoes I had were just fine, but I suppose the other boys on the team had gotten new shoes. And I remember walking into the kitchen, mom and dad were in the kitchen, and I just matter of factly said that I needed some new shoes. And I told them what kind of shoes I needed. And I'll never forget my dad, my dad looked at me and he said, how are your shoes from last year and I said they're fine they're they're okay to practice in and he looked at me and he said do they fit you okay and I said yeah they fit me fine I just need the uh, the new ones before season starts dad said well son I'm gonna have to ask you if if you could just make those work this year now, th this wasn't we weren't rich people. I don't think my dad ever made more than fifty or sixty thousand dollars in a year, but he and mom stretched the pennies and 
we lived a really good life. And this was a kid, he himself was the only one of 15 kids who even had a high school education, and he grew up hungry poor, literally. It was, there wasn't even enough food always for my dad. He was, he was the proud kid with one pair of blue jeans, and his mom washed them every day, and didn't invite friends to his house because he didn't want them to see the shanty they lived in. So my dad grew up that way and dug his way out and gave his kids something that he gave them the things that he had never had. Later in life, he reflected that maybe he gave us so much that he forgot to give us the thing, the thing that got him where he was, which was work ethic and determination. He said, the things that I tried to protect you from may have been the things that you needed the most. But on this particular day, a very ungrateful me, I remember my dad just, as I protested, my dad just did something that was strange. He turned and he walked down in the living room and he walked over and he sat in a little green chair that was one of those swivel chairs that could turn all the way around. And as he sat down in the chair, I just, I remember the look on his face. It was different. I had never seen it before, but he seemed defeated. I continued my protest, ignoring what I was seeing in his face. I continued my protest. My father was a pretty strong guy that would normally not be talked back to. And on a normal day, he would have looked at my smart mouth and said, I need you to stop and just go. But this day, Ray, he didn't. He just, I'll never forget watching him as he swiveled his chair. And he swiveled his chair until his back was to me. It angered me, and I came around the chair, continuing my protest, demanding the shoot. But as I came around to continue my argument, it, it was a something I've never seen before. I don't think I've seen my father cry three times in my life, but his eyes were closed and big tears. <laughs> Forty years later, I, it's, I remember it as one of the pivotal moments in my growing up. Stymied by his tears, I backed up. I went into the kitchen and my mom was there and she was crying too. And she began to explain to me that our family was in a financial crisis that I had been shielded from. There was fear that we might even lose our home. And of course, none of that had gotten through. But I remember my mom inviting me into adulthood, looking at me and saying, your dad is broken hearted and there's nothing he'd rather do than get you those shoes but he's in a hard place right now. Something clicked in my brain, and I went from that petulant, ungrateful little jerk. I quietly left the house, and that day I went out and found a job. And... As I reflect back on that day, something happened in my heart that had never happened before. A, a chamber of my heart opened that I had not known. It was an incredible feeling. It was a feeling of being born again. And the chamber that opened to my heart that day was gratitude. I looked at a man that I expected so much of and appreciated so little. How sharper than a serpent's tooth, opined King Lear, is to have a thankless child. Said Michael Levine, the sign outside the gates of salvation says simply this, be grateful. It was Robert Louis Stevenson who said, the person who has stopped being thankful has fallen asleep in life. And it was Cicero who said, a thankful heart is the parent of all virtues. We've long debated which of the virtues is the greatest, and I don't know that I would put gratitude at the top, but I do think gratitude for me would at least be in the top three. 
believing as I do in the givenness of life, that life is a gift, it stands to reason that the first position as humans is that of recipient. My first position above all of others, my first position is that of a receiver, the receiver of the gift of life. And it makes sense to me that the first disposition and response to that should be one of gratitude. At the substrate, the foundation of my character should be a heart of gratitude. The Apostle Paul was on his second missionary journey when he made his way per a Macedonian call from Asia into Europe. He made his way onto the European continent for the first time, and the first church that he established there was a church on the Via Ignatia, a road that connected the east to the west, a road that Paul trod. The little city was a town called Philippi. It was a prominent Roman colony, and Paul decided to hunker down there. You remember he went down to the riverbank to see if there were any Jewish people there like him who were people of prayer, and he found a woman who was a seller of purple. Her name was Lydia, and he shared the gospel with her and had prayer with her, and she was baptized and became a follower of Jesus and, and became a supporter of Paul, invited him into her home. And we think that the church at Philippi was started there. One of the things I like about uh, the book of Philippians, which I, I do want to mention this, Philippians is, is, is a difficult one to spell because I always get confused. Is it two L's or two P's? I have a friend who has Philippians 4.9 tattooed on her ankle and Philippians is spelled wrong. You really need to check the word. It's two L's instead of one P, Philippians. So tattooed is, is her gratitude. Philippians 4.9 is about gratitude and her poor spelling tattooed right on her ankle. But Philippians is a, is a lovely book because Paul has kind of a tenuous relationship with some of the churches that he writes to, especially like Corinth. But his... His relationship with the Philippian church is really lovely. And he wrote a pastoral letter that I want to conclude with today, just a portion of Scripture that I want to conclude with today. It's a, it's a portion of a pastoral letter that is just, Philippians is just lovely from beginning to end. And I, I, I don't need to say a lot about that except just to tell you, if you ever, if you ever feel a little discouraged and want to open your Bible and, and find some strength, Philippians is, is that book. I read it this week as I was reading Frankel's book. What we know about the letter to the Philippians is that the immediate occasion for the letter was the return to Philippi of a man named Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus had been sent by the Philippian church to Paul bearing gifts to encourage him. He was sent by the Philippian church. Epaphroditus was sent to Paul to bring him gifts because Paul was in prison. And while Epaphroditus was there spending time with Paul in prison, Epaphroditus became so ill he almost died. Upon his su sufficient recovery, Paul sent him back to the Philippian church with a letter, and we know that is the letter of the Philippians. And the portion that for me is just the loveliest is, I'll read this in the contemporary English version, it's Philippians 4, 6 through 19. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. With thankful hearts, offer up your prayers and request to God. Then, because you belong to Christ Jesus, God will bless you with peace that no one can completely understand. And this peace will control the way you think and feel. Finally, my friends, keep your minds on whatever is true, whatever is pure, things that are right, things that are holy. Think about things that are friendly and proper. Don't ever stop thinking about 
worthwhile things, things that are worthy of praise. Friends, you know the teachings I gave you, and you know what you heard me say and saw me do. I encourage you now to follow my example. And God, who gives peace, will be with you. An old man writes from a prison cell. The Lord has made me very grateful because at last you thought about me once again. You didn't forget me all these many miles away sitting in this prison cell. Out of sight was not out of mind. Actually, I now know you were thinking about me all along. I realize you just didn't have any chance to show it. I've never complained about having too little. I want you to know I have learned how to be satisfied with whatever I have. I know what it's like to be poor and I know what it's like to have plenty. I've lived under all kinds of conditions. I know what it means to be full or to be hungry, to have too much or to have too little. I also know that Christ has given me strength in every circumstance to face anything. But with that said, I wanted to tell you it was really good of you to help me when I was having such a hard time. My friends at Philippi, you remember what it was like when I started preaching the good news there in Macedonia. You remember when I left there, you remembered me, and honestly, you were the only church that ever became my partner. You became my partner, giving blessings and receiving them in return. Partners we have been, giving and receiving. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you helped me more than once. I hope you know I've never been trying to get something from you. I've always wanted you to receive blessings that come from my giving. But I have to tell you now, I've been paid back everything and with interest. I want you to know I'm completely satisfied with the gifts you sent with Epaphroditus. As much as I could have done without them, I want you to know they really are like a sweet-smelling offering. I think they're the right kind of sacrifice that pleases God. And I wanted you to know that I'm grateful. And I want you to know from this prison cell, I'm going to be praying that God will take care of all your needs and he will supply them with the wonderful blessings that come from Christ Jesus. Is that just the loveliest thing you've heard? As an old French proverb said, gratitude is the heart's memory. Sitting in a prison cell like Frankel in the concentration camp Paul reminisces and he follows his own advice and he directs his own attention away from his pain, away from his lack, away from his fear, away from all those things he can't control and he focuses his mind, his mind on the true. Sitting in that prison cell hungry, he focused his mind not on what he didn't have what he had he focused his mind on the pure and the right the holy the friendly the proper he called it the truly worthwhile stuff and his heart remembers the Philippians love and gratitude truly is the heart's memory it's so dangerous to focus on what we don't have It's so dangerous to focus on what we don't have, and especially in light of what others have. I know Louis C.K. fell into hard times by his own hand in recent years, but the embattled comic said something so profound one day about his two children. He said, I gave my daughter a bowl of cereal, and he said she was ho so happy, and she dove into it, and she was eating it with full joy. And then her sister came in and sat down beside her and I poured her a bowl of cereal. And he said, immediately I saw my first daughter's countenance fall. She quit eating her cereal and she started staring at her sister's cereal. Finally, he said, I asked her what was wrong. And he said, well, 
She said, well, you gave her more than you gave me. And he said, of course, I, I, I could have told her, you could always ask for more. He said, I, I, I could have told her what was true, and that was I'm just a busy single dad trying to put cereal in bowls, and I wasn't measuring. He said, I could have told her, well, your sister's bigger than you. I could have come up with everything. But he said, in that moment, my experience was of sadness. He said, I looked at a little girl, and he said, I saw a vision of not just her life, but so many of our lives. And he said, these words dropped into my heart. And I looked at her and said, sis, don't ever, don't ever look in somebody else's bowl to see if your bowl has enough in it. And don't ever look in someone else's bowl unless it's to see if they have enough. Frank Clark said, if a person isn't thankful for what they have now, they're likely not going to be thankful for what they will have one day. Greta Wiseman, who like Frankel was a prisoner in a concentration camp, wrote of her experience in a book I read a few years ago. The book is called All But My Life. It was adapted into a 1995 short film called One Survivor Remembers, and I would commend it to you. In her memoir, she recalled an episode one spring when she and her fellow inmates there in the concentration camp were standing at roll call for hours on end. She said, we were being tortured in the heat, nearly collapsing with hunger and fatigue. But she said, we noticed in the corner of that bleak, horrid gray place Standing there in the heat and our hunger, one by one we began to notice, and as more people's attention was drawn, more and more people's attention followed. We noticed standing there in that bleak, horrid gray place that the concrete had broken, and a tiny flower had poked its head through. She said, for the next few days, I watched as thousands of women took great pains to avoid stepping on that tiny flower. It was the only spot of beauty in our ugly and heinous world, and we were so deeply thankful for it. Later in a radio interview, she added, when people ask me, how did you go on? She said, there's only one picture that comes to mind. The moment was when once I stood at the window of the first camp I was in and I asked myself, if by some miraculous power one wish could be granted me, what would it be? There was no thoughts of gold, diamonds, or millions of dollars, no thoughts of mansions fair. She said with almost crystal clarity, as I thought, if there were one wish granted me, what would it be? She said, the picture that came to my mind was a picture at home, my father smoking his pipe, my mother working at her needlepoint, my brother and I doing our homework. And I remember thinking, my goodness, it was just a boring evening at home. I had known countless evenings like that. And yet I knew now that this picture would be if I could help at the driving force of my survival. As we leave here today to go into our week, a few simple thoughts. One, gratitude really is something we choose. Number two, gratitude does require humility, vulnerability, the ability to admit our need, the ability to admit that we need the provision of the other that we would be less than without the other. And finally, I, I think it's a good thought to remember that the words think and thank are related. They come from the same root. To be thankful, we must be thoughtful. We must be mindful. Scarcely could have an experience impacted me more 
than that day with my father, and scarcely could words have impacted me more than for a few people I have dearly loved and needed to have told me they did not sense that I was grateful. To be thankful, I must be thoughtful, mindful. I must think fondly and then express that thinking and that fond thought. I'll leave you with this. When my 23-year-old son, Stan Jr., was nine years old, he fell into a terrible habit of complaining about the food he was given for dinner. He was the typical kid that the third generation of people who had dug their way out my father only hoped that there would be dinner. My father only ate one school lunch in his entire 12 years of school. In 10th grade, they instituted free lunches from my dad and his sisters. He was so happy that he was going to finally get to eat lunch. But the day he showed up at the lunchroom, they had a sign above a separate line that said free meals and my dad and his two sisters were the only ones standing in it he only ate one lunch and never stood in that line again i always had plenty of food but i didn't dare say what are we having for dinner because you ate what was cooked and you were glad of it but by the third generation people like me our kids complain and say i don't like that and if you want to look in the mirror, just look at your child. Because Stan Jr. was only complaining because I had taught him that it was okay by allowing it. After a few weeks of that and being aggravated, I finally did what some would say you shouldn't do and perhaps you shouldn't do it, but it came to me and it felt right because I had just been to Haiti working at a friend of mine's orphanage there and I set Stan Jr. down after one particular diatribe he had spent about how he didn't like the meal that had been cooked and I told him that night about a little girl I'd recently met there in Haiti whose mother had full-blown AIDS and had left the little girl after dying she had left the little girl to care for her 11-month-old sister I told him how I saw this little girl that was even younger than him every day while I was in Haiti carrying her 11-month-old sister all the way across town to receive a bowl of rice. And I told him about how grateful she was. And then I told him about his granddad and how he had lived a life not terribly far from that and how hungry his granddad had grown up being. And Again, some would say in Parenting 101, you shouldn't shame your children, but I, I suppose there's a lot of unhealthy shame. But in a world like ours, with as much as we have not to be grateful and not to recognize how other people live, I think there are some things we probably should be ashamed about. And this was a moment I think my son should have been ashamed. I think it's sinful to not be grateful in a world where little seven-year-old girls carry their 11-month-old little sister across town for a bowl of rice and are happy. The absence of gratitude surely comes close to what we would call sin. But I loved my son's response. He looked at me, he took it all in, and he said, you mean she carries her all the way across and they their mothers and I said yes bub and there are millions of people who live just like that after a bit of silence he said something that I think is at the heart of repentance and at the heart of us getting a hold of ourselves and setting our minds on right things and setting our attitudes in right ways, my son simply looked at me and said, I hadn't thought about that. And I... 
I think about that sometime. Just the simple profundity of that. Those born again moments, those epiphanies, those moments when your father's tears and closed eyes, those moments that it hits you. I haven't, I hadn't thought about that. But now I have, and now I'm going to fix it. Fix your thoughts on things that are true and pure and right and holy and friendly and proper and honorable and beautiful and admirable, lovely and noble, but above all else, be grateful. Be grateful. There is so much to be grateful about. Can you say amen? Let's pray. Lord, we say this word so glibly. It's like filler, but not today. I restart my prayer. Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you that I who might not have been am. Thank you for all that we have. Thank you for these people and for what this place means to me. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for my kids. Thank you for our old dog that we put to sleep yesterday because she just couldn't go on anymore. Thank you for the love that will always be inside of us. Those 10 good years of a buddy like Annabelle. Just thank you for Salzburg Mountains and Summit's beautiful. And thank you for boring nights at home. Thank you for the little flowers that come up through the cracks of the harsh concrete of our life. Fix our hearts, Lord, with gratitude, we pray. We certainly have so much, so much to be thankful for. We pray these things in Christ's name. And everybody said, Amen. And you're just best. Go with a heart of gratitude and be good to one another. <laughs>